So this will be on uh, you know, shortly. Um, good. Chapter six, capital investment decision. So again, this chapter, uh, there's going to be a couple that we're going to talk about. We've been talking about net present value. What we've been doing in this class so far is we have figuring out how to calculate cash flows. Right? That was the operating cash flow section. Uh, once we figure out how to uh, calculate cash flows, then we talked about investment. You know, we, we in chapter four we learned how to move those cash flows around in time. Right? This is the time value of money, the annuity section, uh, and. Uh, now, you know, the last chapter we did, we said, okay, well, now we can estimate cash flows. Now we can move them around in time. Let's use net present value. Let's, you know, let's learn about net present value and so forth so we can start re you know, looking at the rules by which we will make decisions. And this chapter is uh, finally going to bring all that together. So for a particular case, we're going to um, uh, estimate the cash flows, arrange them in time, uh, and find the present value of them, calculate net present value, and decide whether we... Uh, accept or reject the project, whether we want to build a factory or not build a factory, right? So this is sort of the culmination of, of um, what we've been doing with, with estimating cash flows and decision rules and time value money. The only thing I'll say right off the bat, so right now, uh, in order to decide whether we're going to build a factory, we, you know, we need cash flows, which we've, you know, which we, which we figured out how to estimate. Uh, we need to know how to move those cash flows you know, forward or backwards in time. The only thing we haven't learned to calculate is what? The only thing left that we haven't, we're just given um, uh, at this point is the discount rate. So in other words, we're pretty self-contained in terms of uh, estimating the cash flows, uh, arranging them in time, moving them around in time, using that present value and, and deciding whether to accept the project. The only thing that even in this chapter we're still or have just taken as a given is the cost of capital K. Which explains why the chapter right after this we talk about the cap M, Markowitz, the cap M, the APT, and that finally will give us the cost of capital. So once we learn how to get the sort of the cost of capital, um, and we, we do a lot of benchmarking to get the cost of capital, so I can talk about how you get that today, uh, but then we're completely self-sustained, right, in, in deciding on whether, uh, what sort of capital investments to make. Does that make sense? All right. So the idea here is, you know, we'll go through a couple. The important thing is at the end of the chapter, we'll bring up Excel and we'll go through a, a bunch of examples, and that's the best way to learn the material. Before we do that, however, there's just a couple, um, uh, there's a couple big, you know, pitfalls that you can make that, that, that we should talk about in terms of capital budgeting. Um, good. So first of all, uh, it goes without saying, uh, when we, in the capital budgeting process, we're deciding on capital investments that we use cash flows and not, a, not accounting profit, right? Um, we know that. Uh, the one thing, uh, the only thing to modify that is in all of these we are use incremental. Our focus is on incremental cash flows. So in other words, what this means is we only want to consider cash flows which change as a result of accepting or rejecting the project, right? So in other words, um, uh, what we can think of is, um, let's say we have, we're building a factory, right? What we're looking at is, this is the cash flows of our, of our entire company if we build a factory, these are the cash flows if we don't build a factory, and the difference between the two, and those are incremental cash flows. But in other words, if a cash flow doesn't change, uh, given the accept or reject decision, then we don't want to consider it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we're only here, uh, when you're um, uh, thinking about whether we should include a cash flow, Include something in this capital budget, all you have to think about is, uh, is it incremental to the project? Right? Uh, is this cash flow dependent on whether we accept or reject the project? I remember if there's anything else I want to say. Incremental to the project, um, yes, good. Uh, which, of course, means, we, we've heard the term sunk cost, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't want to include uh, any sunk cost in the project. So what's a classic example of sunk cost? money it took to buy the building. Well, yeah, I mean, if we bought the building, so we own the building, we still, we're still we going to still consider the cost of the building because that's an opportunity cost, meaning uh, we could sell it or we could rent it out. So that, that sort of the cost of the building would still be, if we're going to use that to house our factory, would still be in there somewhere, would still, would still be included in the project, um, included as an opportunity cost. Maybe I realize I haven't got my coffee out. R&D. 
Yeah, so the classic example of this is like a marketing stuff, right? So in other words, I do a marketing, I pay a, a marketing firm a million dollars to see if uh, there's a market for my, pro, uh, for my um, product, right? So the idea here is if I, now I'm going to decide whether to, to build a factory to manufacture that product. I don't want to include the cost of the marketing report in there because it's paid. It's done. Whether I build a factory or not, I still pay that $1 million. Right? So that's a classic example of a sunk cost, and we do not include sunk cost um, because, again, it's not incremental. It, you know, we're paying it no matter what. Um, so you know, when you're thinking of something, decide, trying to decide whether something's a sunk cost, just think of it as, is it incremental to the project? If we accept the project, you know, in that case, if we accept the project, we pay the million. If we don't accept the project, we pay the million. So it's not incremental. Right? It's a sunk cost. We're already paying it. Good. Um, now this is the next one. Is a little bit more, well, I don't want to say controversial if things can get controversial, but um, there's a concept of erosion. So in other words, an example of this, and I'll use a sort of illustrative example that, you know, that, that happened. Uh, if we are going, let's say, let's say we are Intel. And we're, we're just trying to decide if we're going to build a, a newer chip. So the question is, do we include the fact that if we start selling the newer chip, it will uh, it'll steal sales away from the older chips that we have? Does that make sense? That would be a rose. So what, do you have any opinion on that? My uh, preference is to not include a rose. Um, is, or or uh, I am very I am very unlikely to include it. It'd have to be s sort of a very clear and special case for me to include erosion in, in uh, capital budgeting calculations. That's simply because do we know what happened to Intel? Let's say you decide you include these erosion costs, and for that reason you say, okay, well I won't build a new chip. I won't build a faster chip. What could happen? What did happen? Competition will make the new chip. Yeah, AMD will, right? So in other words, I would say I would say that's not incremental because if I don't introduce the new chip, someone will, and that that those sales will be eroded anyway. So if 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 you look at it that way and say, okay, well if I don't do it, AMD will, then it's no longer an incremental cost, right? You're going to lose that sale no matter what because the technology's you know out there. The, the technology will be out there, right? So you know uh, I won't ask an exam necessarily an exam question on this, or if I do, I won't. You know, it won't be a cut and dry answer like that. You know, um, uh, if you want to say that, you know, some texts will say that you should include erosion, and that's fine. So I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to. to um, if you answer something in that way, that that's perfectly fine. Uh, so I'll generally tend to stay away from this on exams. But my own preference is not to include erosion, simply because your competition will do it. Right? So, um, so uh, 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 don't include those costs. Um, now. Uh, one other, one thing to to you know we'll, we'll also be talking about our synergies. This synergy, um, these these terms are usually used in terms of mergers and acquisitions. In other words, this is kind of the idea in mergers and acquisitions where uh, the sum of the two com the, the two the, the two companies together are worth more than the sum of the parts, which can uh, which can be true. In a lot of mergers and acquisitions, there's no way to say that this merger had a positive net present value if you didn't include a lot of positive synergies. Uh, so there can be, you know, there, there can be quite a few synergies. Um, this would be a topic where you, you would maybe want to spend a little bit of time on, particularly with respect to mergers and acquisitions and quantifying synergies. But they won't come up in any basic capital budgeting problem that we have uh, in this chapter. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave them at that. Um, Good. Now here's a uh, here's an important one, and this will be on the exam. And this is is something we we actually mess up. Um, well, it's messed up quite a lot. It's messed up here often when you're when you're trying to um, you know expand. Uh, they, um, people have made the mistake of including allocated costs. But the idea is this, and I think on a previous exam I asked this question. Uh, let's say you, you're thinking of opening up a, a new, you're going to, you're accepting, you're, you're thinking of maybe opening up a new factory, or so there's no, some project that will acquire 
require putting 15 more engineers at your headquarters, right? So would it be okay for me to say, okay, well, there's 15 more engineers at this headquarter because of this project, and these engineers are going to use 10% of the cafeteria, so I will allocate 10% of the cafeteria cost to this project. Now, assume that the cafeteria is going to be there anyway. I see a no. You think no? Well, is, it is, it, is the cafeteria an incremental cost? No, the cafeteria is going to be there anyway, so you do not include uh, the, the cost of the, 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 you know, the cafeteria that those, um, that those new employees will use. Uh, this is actually, again, I, I mentioned this is around here. Sometimes we're, you know, if I want to, uh, I've talked about offering like a summer course, right? And they'll say, okay, well, if you want to offer a summer course, they'll start allocating costs, university costs, to my summer course, right? So in other words, uh, and I ask them, I say, what's in this, you know, so I've actually had this conversation. What's in this cost? I'm like, is it the mowing the lawn fees and so forth, right? You know? and they, yeah. I'm like, well, you're going to mow the lawn anyway, right? So that should not go into whether I offer this course. That's a, that's, that's a, don't allocate that cost to my course because you're going to pay that anyway. They'll do the same thing with the library. I say, I don't need any additional library resources than what is already there. But they'll start assigning my course a library fee where I, my enrollment has to cover that. That's, again, a classic example of an allocated cost. You should even go, um, you're going to pay that library fee whether I offer my course or not, so it's not incremental. It shouldn't be a part of it. You should only include now. If I, my course would require five more dollars of library services per student, then you can, then you can allocate that five dollars to my course, right? Because that's incremental. But if it's not incremental to my course, you would never, um, you would never include that. Does that make sense? The one thing I can say is, uh, historically, um, uh, allocated costs are the, sort of the toughest thing that, from an accounting standpoint, you want to allocate these costs across to whoever is using the service. Right? So from an accounting standpoint, I want to allocate a certain por a portion of this fee to whatever cost center is using it, which is fine. That's an accounting thing to do. But when we're looking at uh, whether we should you know, build a factory or add a course or something like that, you, you don't want to start allocating costs that way. You only want to, uh, because they're not incremental, you're going, to, you're going to pay it no matter what. So it's kind of like a sunk cost? Mm -hmm. That's a perfectly good way of saying it. It's sunk. It's your, it's, um, uh, you're going to pay it anyway. So don't allocate it across to, to uh, new projects that you're thinking of. So what's the difference? Um, well, I mean, I wouldn't say that there's like a sort of cut and dry difference. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine to say you can think of it as it's sunk, so I shouldn't, shouldn't <laughs> allocate this cost across. One thing that might be uh, useful to think about is what would happen if you start allocating costs? And I've, I've actually brought this up. So let's say uh, you say uh, you won't, I want to offer a summer course. I'll use a summer course thing because I, I can go through this example quite a bit. Right? Um, uh, and they say no. So why don't I offer that summer course? What happens to those allocated costs then? So let's say you know the allocated costs for the library to my course were $100. And like you said, they're sunk, so they're, they're going to be paid by someone. What happens if... You don't, my course doesn't go, so you don't accept my course. What happens to that $100? Still paid. What's that? Still paid. Spread across the other, it's spread across the other courses. So every other course now, so let's say, you know, there, there, were, there were 10 other courses. So mine would be the 11th. There's 10 other courses. So now every other course has a 110 library fee. Now that pushes one course over to the, un, you know, so-called unprofitable threshold, right? And then so you don't offer that course. And then what happens to that 110? So they just don't want summer courses pretty much? No, they're, they're making a mistake by saying, uh, and this is usually what they do, they say it's not profitable. I say, you don't decide whether to, uh, work, to accept a project on profitability. Profitability is an accounting measure. You use capital budgeting. So this is to show that what we're doing, you cannot make business decisions off of an income statement. And that's their problem. They're saying, well, if I look at the income statement, it's not profitable. Say that's not what the income statement is for. It's a complete misunderstanding of why we have income statements. And this is why we have accountants make income statements, and financial managers decide whether we should build a factory or not. We don't sit there and go, well, this is our income statement. Let's build a factory. 
<laughs> this is a uh, um, we, we 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 use special you know capital budgeting techniques where we're dealing with cash flows. Uh, we're we're dealing with when those cash flows are incurred, and we're only dealing with incremental costs. So you cannot make a decision unless you you do that. So it's a it's a fundamental misunderstanding of why we're using um, accounting statements. But the idea here is you know so if this course isn't offered, then all that 110 gets allocated, and then the threshold gets higher. Then you see another course. So what you can do is by not offering courses, you're cutting, 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 and you're getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse as you cut. Does that make sense? So uh, yeah. So that's a you know perfect example of why people can cut their budget, cut their budget, cut their budget, and run their company on the ground uh, because they're they're looking at these allocated costs where you sit there and say, okay, well. This 110 was, this 100 was never part of my course, you're going to pay it anyway, so then, you know, then my course, uh, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be part of the threshold. Good. All right. Uh, any questions on allocated costs? Uh, allocated costs. That's one of the big ones. There will be a, um, there will be, you know, exam question on that. Like concept-wise or? Yeah, uh, definitely concept-wise. So I'll say, should you include this cost? And I think an exact exam question in the past has been, uh, you, with your, you, you have 15 new engineers and, you know, they're going to use the cafeteria. Should you assign those cafeteria costs? That was an exact question. So, um, it would be something like that. Does that make sense? So, the uh, next part of the class, uh, or part of the text, uh, goes into an actual capital investment um, uh, example. So, this is the Baldwin Company uh, 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 example. This is not... This is not uh, difficult. Uh, however, what I'm thinking of doing is, is maybe talking about some other concepts and then coming back to this. Because when I do this, I, uh, it, it makes sense for me to just stop, bring up Excel, and walk through it. There's only a couple things that I really need to talk about uh, here that you don't already know. There's one, one uh, I'll talk about at least this, and then, and then we'll come back to this example. Uh, on any exam question, and what I'll generally do is simplify things and use straight line depreciation instead of this MACRS. So they have the modified accelerated cost recovery.